Whoa, it's a double chair. Uh, that was a great way. Okay, we're all energized now. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back to the Digital Plus Performance Convening. It's hard when you're sitting in a circle to know where to, where to, where to talk. Um, just before we get started, I just wanted to kind of just talk a little bit about how the morning went and, and like some, some things that the Spiderweb show and how round team saw from the morning and, and just how kind of disparate the two sessions were that we started this kind of conversation. We were bouncing ideas off of each other and, and when we were going in one direction and then the next session became kind of more of almost like a panel discussion but across Zoom with tough audio and like a lot of light and like a lot of... Uh, just a lot to take in. And so uh, just to acknowledge that that is where we are in this conversation today and that this afternoon we're trying to re-energize and bring back a lot of those values and, and the kind of the nature of the conversation, uh, of the first conversation that we had. Um, I also uh, just wanted to just talk about cell phones a little bit. Like this is the interactivity um, session we're about to start. And so I really wanna give permission for people to use phones and hopefully use them in a way that's related to this discussion. So nobody's in trouble for having their phone out. And uh, you know, but also it'd be cool if you tweeted something. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is a uh, hi to the internet. Uh, it's good to remember that there is an online audience here with us. Welcome, Internet, to the Isabel Bader Center for the Performing Arts and the Digital Plus Performance Convening run by HowlRound in collaboration with Spiderweb Show. And if you have anything to say, please tweet something to hashtag Folda, and I will look at this board maybe and see if I can't bring at least one or two of your comments into this conversation as well. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say is if you've signed up for the electric company's VR experience, Kyle's right there. Kyle will take you in at your time. So that you just go over to Kyle and that's how you go and, and do that experience today. Great, okay, so here we are. Session three, artists and audience interactivity, AKA from monologue to dialogue. Uh, and so uh, I have with me here, and you can just put up your hand so people know who you are, JD Derbyshire, Jen Stevenson, Kristen McWhorter, Whit McLaughlin, and Brenda Baker Harger. Okay, welcome and thank you. So we all know how this works. I'm just gonna check somebody's timing, somebody's timing here, anyone? Bueller, Bueller. Uh, thank you, Adrian's gonna, yes, can we have the chimes? Thank you. I don't need to chime anyone's talking, but I just need to know when we're gonna move the circle outwards. Uh, maybe do some math on how much time we got left and let me know, thanks. Okay, great. So, uh, so this session, you know, we've so we started by talking about strengths, weaknesses that we think is going on in the digital shift. Then we talked to Prague about what they've been thinking about at the Prague Quadrennial. And now this conversation is very specifically about interactivity. How has the interactive nature of digital tools changed, modified, not changed at all? Uh, the way that artistic practice manifests itself. And uh, I'm gonna start by throwing to Jen uh, Stevenson because her and I had a really interesting email back and forth just about participation and like mm, the ethics and the assumptions of that. Uh, uh, hi, okay, so um, I'm Jen Stevenson and I am, uh, I'm a what? I'm a scholar and a writer and I think the writing part is really is really important to me, so I try and uh, see. I try and see a lot of work, and I try and think about what I've seen, and then I try and communicate that to, um, in various formats. Some of them scholarly, and some of them more popular. Uh, and the thing that I'm thinking about a lot at the moment is this word participation, um, and thinking about some of the roots of participation. Um, I think we're I think we're living in a moment where. Um, we're seeing a flourishing of participation in lots and lots of ways. Um, and I think some of that, I think there's two roots where that comes from. I think one of them has to do with um, a desire for authenticity, a desire for, um, I'm gonna say unmediated connection. We can talk about what exactly that means to be unmediated, but we're interested in, we're interested in um, realness, we're interested in liveness, we're interested in things that are authentic, things that we know where they come from. Um, and we see this in lots and lots of ways. We see this in the, desire for um, DIY, we see this in desire for, you know, organic vegetables and backyard chickens and um, um, vintage clothing, all this kind of thing. We want to know where stuff came, comes from and we don't want to be connected to it really 
um, really intimately, and I think we want to be involved. We like things that are custom and that are ab about us and for us. So I think that's one part of it, um, which leads to this sort of tr um, desire for participation, to to make the thing itself, to, to make the art, to make the story, to to be involved, to have it be for me, by me, about me. I think there's, and there's some narcissistic element to that as well. Um, and the other thing is that maybe the technology aspect is I think some of it, um, this participation is um, enabled by, think about, um, think about Web 2.0, think about in technologies that now become interactive, um, thinking about being able to write back to, um, to, to self-produce, to write, and have lots of people read it. We all have our own printing presses now. We all have our own personal publishing houses now. We, we, can, um, we can take photos and has, has millions and millions of people can see them. And so I think we expect we expect to be artists, we expect to be authors, we all expect to be creators, because technology has put that into our, into our hands, again, direct contact with a lot of people. Um, so I think those two trends together um, are feeding, um, feeding participation in art. We're seeing more and more participatory art. Um, so that's what I think about a lot. Um, and then I have a whole bunch of questions. So some of the questions about ethics, about what does it mean from an ethical point of view, to make, um, for me to labor, to produce my own art, to be to be a participant involves some of my, um, I become a laborer. Um, I also think that my stuff is being used, my physical labor is being used, but my emotional labor is being used, and my um, my autobiographical data is being used. Um, and I say used, but the paradox is I like it. I want, I want to give all this stuff. I want to feel engaged. And so I'm really interested in that tension between how, it, by participating, we are, we're being commodified. We're being, we're being used. We're not being uh, compensated. And, and then we're being, uh, I'm not tricked, not tricked, um, but we're being pulled in. We're being caught um, to, to enjoy it and desire it. So I think there's something, something rich and complicated there. Yeah, I mean, that for me connects to some conversations that Wit and I had on the phone previous to this conversation, just about what the possible future of the internet could be. Like this, this, I think we talked about this phrase of like the walls disappearing, and I'm wondering if you could connect anything that, that we were talking about to what Jen said there. Uh, Whit McLaughlin. Um, yeah, I think early on there was a, a dream somehow that the internet could evaporate barriers between people. Um, and I don't know where we are with that dream right now. Um, in some ways, it's become partly about building walls between people and, and in very sophisticated ways. Um, but the idea was that somehow uh, connectivity was going to take what happened in the darkened room of the theater with the moat around it and the ticket taker and explode open the walls and we would suddenly like feel this transparency, this translucency and, and, and uh, um, everybody could come, whether they were a ticket buyer or not and somehow the internet was going to give us this um, uh, boundaryless world. And I'm kind of wondering where we are with that. And, and, and so if we're talking about interactivity, what, what kind of interactivity are, are, are we wanting here? And, and that leads me to think about technology a lot and, and wonder if we're building walls with technology or whether we're evaporating them. Um, I, I feel like um, maybe what we're wondering is, are we really going in the right direction when we're thinking about kind of content delivery, user interface, the sort of hard bubble of the technology gizmo that's in your hand, or the that you know the thing that's that's um, pulling us down this path towards quote, what I earlier called uh, innovation inflation, um, and I'm not positive that's really a good term but or um, are we looking for something a little more ephemeral are, is there some way that interactivity can get the screen out of the center of the experience and I think of Elijah's cup at the Seder uh, like there's a seat there empty and the table is you know is lined with people who are going to eat and then there's one 
seat, maybe, uh, not to go too far with that metaphor, but, but maybe that's where the digital apparatus sits. And it's not the center, and we're not all looking at it, but it's over there. Because I wonder if there's a way to use digital technology that actually enhances the possibility of serendipity. If it, if it can enhance the uh, kind of spaciousness of space, if there's some way that artists, and I, I wonder when you, when you talk, where does the where is the artist in this? Do we even need the artist, or or uh, you know what's the value of artistry, and what can the artist do in an era where and and I have to say, over time I start to actually become suspicious that the um, outreach effort is really kind of just another way of saying, or engagement, another way of saying audience development, that we're, we're sort of trying to monetize our relationships or the creative impulses of other people to harvest their data, to get them to come see our thing, you know, to, it, it's really a, 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 an advertisement for ourselves. So uh, to me, serendipity, or is it possible to build true contingency into our performances using um, using um, digital media. Can we, uh, and contingency really means the fact that what is happening could at any point be something else for no reason at all. Hmm. And is the, de is the decision tree kind of getting in our way here, this kind of, content delivery, we're pushing some message out to people and they're going to respond and, you know. I, I, I mean, this makes me think about Brenda, what, what we were talking about, about the, the difference between interactivity and immersion and them as, as separate concepts. And I'm just wondering, I feel like a lot of uh, what we just heard from Wit kind of is related to that distinction. Okay. So I have a lot of opinions about these things, but uh, and I have a lot of questions. So um, I'm starting. I start from an improvisational perspective, which is kind of like raising your own chickens, right? So it's it's or <laughs> it's at the very beginning. You have nothing but you know your mind, your body, and each other in order to create, and you're creating in real time. So when you start from that perspective. The, the question is, uh, why are you doing it? You know, what are you trying to create? And is technology the proper way to realize your vision? So what's your story? Everything is story. And what's the best way to tell that story? As far as um, immersion and interactivity go, I've done a lot of dabbling in interactivity because it's interesting. Immersion to me is is a little bit easier because you can you can bring the audience into an experience and surround them with the experience without asking anything of them, right? Asking any uh, you know participation that's going to affect the story or you know maybe they'll be emotionally affected. Um, interactivity, in my uh, definition, requires some sort of agency on the part of the, um, the audience member. And when you have a collective audience in theater, you know, what does that mean? You know, what does it mean to give the audience agency? And, and do they want it? <laughs> and, um, you know, how, and then furthermore, how does that affect the story you're trying to tell? If you believe that story is something that is meant to change us and to, and to affect us emotionally, to trigger our brains into changing our minds and changing our behavior, um, you know, then interactivity becomes very murky. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, video games, which a lot of my students go into, have the same issue. It's just from a different perspective. They're all trying to tell really good stories, but that pesky interactivity kind of gets in the way because, well, if your hero keeps dying, you know, and you have save points, you just go back, you know. How can you be emotionally connected to that? So mm. I think we're all trying to look at interactivity from the same perspective. Is it possible to create interactive experiences that emotionally affect us. Right, well that, I think Kristen leads right into what we were talking about, so I'm not even gonna preface it, because I know <laughs> you know where I'm gonna go. Um, yes, I know where we're going. I just wanted to say really quickly, an, 
an observation I had from this morning was um, it's probably very comfortable for me to use a lot of academic language to talk about what I do. Um, so I just want to give an open invitation to anyone to interrupt me if you don't know what something means or whatever. I was having a hard time following along with some of the language before. Um, but what I think this like really bleeds into is this idea of these immersive, interactive technologies coming with this rhetoric that there's some sort of grand empathy machine um, that um, especially virtual reality, which the lens that I view that history, which I'm not necessarily a reliable narrator, but um, the history of the stereoscopic image certainly um, dates back to the beginning of cinema. And this idea of uh, individualized immersive experience um, for one audience member um, that is like trying to catch on to reality has always been accompanied with some sort of promise that we can escape our subjectivity, that we can jump from one reality into another, that we can have a different body or we can temporarily have a different experience of this life. And while I don't think that that has ever been true of the technology, that promise is incredibly powerful and that promise has always kind of accompanied the technology as it's evolved. So when it comes to audience members having agency, I think another thing that we contend with is the expectations of our audience, what they're coming to the work expecting to experience and how much control we can have over that expectation, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Jen, you and I were, uh, sorry, JD, you and I were talking about just how some of these tools have, outside of, you know, VR and the crazy stuff that it can do, just how it can empower collaboration and, and how, it, how it's changed your approach to practice and other people's practice. And I wondered if you wanted to address that. Yeah, I think uh, I also come from a background of improvisation. And I just wanted to say thank you for everyone who spoke earlier. I'm just making tons of notes and will think deeply about these things and can't think deeply about them right now, but um, <laughs> but I will. Um, yeah, I, and also, with thank you for the title of my next show, Be Something Else for No Reason at All. Um, I appreciate that. I'll, I'll uh, shout out to you. Um, I think that, um, like, where the artist is, is, is that, you know, um, I come from a, I wasn't, I didn't come through university in my theater training. I was at Loose Moose and um, sort of got mentored through and, like, uh, tried, do you want to try directing? Sure. Do you want to try writing a kid's show? Sure. And so I have this... Uh, nature of experimentation in me. And so there's all kinds of tools. Where the artist situation is, is someone said earlier about what we need is artists thinking creatively about the tools. And someone else said, I'm sorry, I can't credit. Uh, someone else said, um, uh, we're outsourcing our digital literacy and learning. So play with these tools, right? Like um, that's, that's what we did last year at Folda. We played with Switcher. We had no idea what we were doing and now it's uh, iterated. Um, there's an old school um, application called, um, or a program called Twine, which is uh, hypertext. And it, it, if you use it, it teaches you how to keep thinking about multiple endings and it's really fun. Um, Game structures we use with kids all the time. We're trying to play with game structure in a way like, it, what if there's no winner and loser? What if you get some of what you want? And by pointing, I work with Adrian Wong uh, on this stuff. Um, what if there's no winner? What if there's no loser? So, but all those ideas came by playing with the tools first, right? By uh, my show um, is now followed sort of by this live segment called Brave Space, where we're talking about how do we all check into our, our emotional lives so that we you know, the biggest problem on the web right now, I think, is it's an echo chamber. So how do we get people talking that don't normally talk? You know, um, text is great for that. Um, you know, uh, in my house, if we're having an argument, we do it on text. And um, that really keeps it um, sane. So, um, uh, you know, I think that play with the tools. Um, these kinds of gatherings are fantastic. You know, there's people here that know uh, no so much hack stuff that's already been built. Uh, we're working on something that is built on the platform of Grindr. Some of you may be familiar with that. And, um, and we're building an app called Kinder. And um, 
you know, shit like that. So lots, lots is already built, and, and, and all you have to do is, you know, I work with this one young person in Vancouver who broke my heart one day when she said, uh, coding is the new creative writing. And, um, and she's right, and so I'm learning code. So far I've built these little lights that will light up on a Raspberry Pi, so. Uh, just be willing to learn other languages, you know, cross-discipline. Um, yeah, the it's always interesting to pop into an academic setting again because stuff happens here. I was saying to Sarah earlier, it'd be great to have a swap meet where we're actually, you know, there's lots of work being done, you know, outside of the academic. People are hacking. And I just wish we could find ways to talk to each other more without having to do degrees necessarily, um, that we could uh, benefit from each other's different kinds of learning. Well, we do have the Canada-US exchange as part of FOLDA, so there, there will be some opportunities for that sort of swap meet thing. I'm just wondering, that's a great kind of, you gave some great, great examples of interactive tools, including Switcher, for those of you who don't, aren't familiar with it, is basically uh, lets you do a three camera live stream, but you can just use three cell phones and an iPad. Uh, and so I think that's a great example of like a way to hack something that used to be like tens of thousands of dollars that can be done with kind of available equipment. And, and I'm wondering if anyone around here has any suggestions or just things that they find uh, are interactive tools that they've seen in the theater that are working, not working, helpful, useful. Uh, we're just hacking, and on Broadway now they have this great system for captioning where it's quite an expensive system, but you can anyone can just use their smartphone and, and have the performance captioned. But you can do that with text, speech to text. So um, do that. Well, uh, it's time to move our chairs back. So this is the time where the, the brave amongst us join in. We're talking interactivity and live performance. What changes? What's different? What works? What sucks about it? We have one lucky joiner, so you definitely get the microphone. All right, just one point sort of picking up on the conversation. I think uh, when you're talking about interactivity, uh, it's uh, important to be clear who's interacting with what, because there are lots of different configurations. So on the one hand, um, you have performers interacting with each other, right? And you've got performers interacting with audience, and then you might, and then you're adding technology into the picture. So where does it fit? So the technology can be an interactor, in which case you can have performers interacting with the technology and the audience watches, and that's actually still a lot of really exciting work happening there, because the technology is truly responding, interacting in many ways. You can have the audience interacting with the technology and creating an interesting dynamic experience with no live performer. But when you try, and, that, and there's millions of applications of that, but I think what people were talking about is when you have the three, where does the technology fit in? And in a lot of the cases that I heard you guys talking about, the way that I would think about it is actually it's people interacting with people with the technology being a conduit and that could happen either through telematic you know, uh, communication, so if you're interacting with people online, uh, maybe through a kind of game engine that creates avatars. Uh, so the technology there, uh, again, is creating an environment for human beings to be interacting with each other. Mm. Um, uh, and, then there are, and that can be happening live, too, even in the most annoying interactive events where you hit the button and you vote on something, and then the performers do something different. There, too, the technology is a way to communicate that interaction. So just to be thinking clearly about where the interaction's happening. A, between technology and person, or person to person? That's right, and with the technology being a conduit, or if the interactivity is on the stage or between the audience. Right, 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 right. Good questions. Something over here? Uh, I think uh, that... Um, like getting people in the virtual uh, world, um, um, sometimes it's um, much more powerful when you actually um, try to make something collective in this virtual world. So we've been developing a multiplayer um, um, theater performance. Um, and um, within um, the action of this uh, performance, 
um, 30 or 50 people are connected together in uh, VR headsets. They can see each other as avatars. And uh, what was really um, like important for us was uh, collective uh, action. So when they are together, they can open a portal in this world. Or when they act together and, um, and do something, then another story appears. So um, as far as I'm concerned, I think this is an interesting approach, uh, not only just putting somebody in another world, but uh, doing something together in it. Um, so that's one issue and um, about interactivity mm, in multiplayer. And another thing uh, which I find very interesting is um, mm, creating a body uh, in VR and um, also interacting with other users uh, who also have a body. Um, and mm, you can mm, analyze and see how people uh, are really mm, like um, omitting the boundaries that are in the real uh, life uh, and act totally differently. Some are more shy, some are totally open. And um, this kind of experience when you have um, some kind of body mm, and multiplayer experiences I find very interactive and very interesting. Does anybody here in the circle like think that maybe this is a false assumption that, that the theater has always been interactive and that this is just a, a new design tool? And that I, I, I bring this up because I think I was making the point on Twitter once, and there's a playwright here in Canada named Michael Healy, who the Canadians will recognize, who like left me a message with a number of exclamation marks <laughs> about about how the theater is always interactive, and I was overselling my case. Um, I think one thing th that in the history of theater that might be of, of use to think about is that audiences didn't tend to be as homogenous as they are now. That in Shakespeare's time, for instance, part of the show, a huge part of the show, was what the audience did to the audience. And, and, and so that it was a three-way kind of, you know, the groundlings, the nobles, I mean, this is the old saw, and then the, the, the actors who were always trying to provoke differentiation and so that you know different people got to see different things so so I, I think th that stimulates interactivity um, that's earlier why I specified interaction through technology is different than interactivity because um, there's a lot of inter interactivity in, in improv for sure um, I worked with a playwright one time who wrote this long treatise after we had worked on an interactive piece about how she flatly disagreed with what we were doing because it didn't, uh, it didn't really address what interactivity was. To her, having people in the same room breathing the same air was interactive. And it's like, okay, so we have to, I think it's finding the right semantics, defining the terms and figuring out what that is. No, I think you're absolutely right about defining the terms. And um, this is where I might take, take issue with, uh, you know, with Michael Healy. I mean, y okay, yes. The yes, theater has always been interactive. I don't want to argue with that. But this is why I I'm not sure interactive is the right word. Um, the word that I've gravitated to is participation. Because part what, the way I'm thinking about participation is um, the, uh, the, um, the audience, and I'm, that may not be even the right word, um, that person occupying that role um, is, um, is, is a contributor, that they, are, they have uh, agency, that word's been used already, they have input, and their contributions shape the work. Their contributions make a difference to what happens. It's n um, in, in a really material way, that the work could not happen without them, not merely by their presence, but the work could not go forward, nothing would happen, nothing would happen without that role. Um, so the word I'm stuck with right now is participation. I'm happy if anyone else would give me a better word um, because I think you have to be take part in something. You have to be, there's an involvement there that word participation speaks to. Um, but I also think audience maybe isn't the right word. Um, I don't think the audience becomes an 
artist. I don't think they displaced the artist. Someone asked, where is the artist? And I think that's a question that is worth pursuing in this context. Um, the word that I'm sticking with right now is uh, player. Because I've heard a lot about games already this morning, thinking about the participatory audience is a, is a player. Um, that's where I'm at. But I would love to hear other people's thoughts about words um, and about, yeah, and about interactivity versus participation or if there's other um, words in that cluster that might fit better the kind of thing we're trying to capture, uh, which I think is new. Yeah, I, I guess I would just want to argue with the notion that theatre has historically been interactive. I think having people in a room doesn't necessarily equate interaction. And I think about, when I think about making theatre that is um, engaging a whole person, I think about my sister when she was learning how to fly fish. And she talked about she loved fly fishing because when you go out into the river, there are all the things that you have to consider in order to be able to catch the fish. You have to consider the temperature of the water, the speed of the current, the temperature of the air, what insects are hatching right now, what time of day it is, where's the sun, where's the shadows that the ro of the rocks, where are the eddies on the water, and where the fish are going to be hiding. So all of those being able to balance and think about all those things is really pleasurable for her. And that makes her feel like she's inside of this experience and that she's not just a, a passenger on someone else's experience. And that, that description from her is something that's guided me a lot as I create work, is like, how am I making use of, which is, again, we're getting over there, but how am I inviting somebody to bring their whole selves into this experience and their three-dimensionality and their complications and their contradictions in a way that they feel like they're being um, uh, invited to participate, invited to problem solve, to, to engage. Yeah, I, I think to like build on that same idea is I do think that when technology becomes involved in participation or interaction, what it does is it creates layers to the experience. And I, somebody this morning said that digital meant an onion. And I, th I was like, yeah, that's a great thing for that to mean. Because I do think that there's a question of where is the primary experience happening? Are the actors who are interacting with each other on stage having the primary experience of the artwork? Actually, probably not. Um, is the person wearing the VR headset having the primary um, interaction? Or are the people in the room watching the person in VR having the primary experience of the artwork? And I think that the artwork can exist anywhere within that continuum per the intention of the artist. Um, but this question of shaping the experience is specific to where you exist in relationship to the technology as those experiences are unfolding. Yeah, so uh, it's been mentioned a couple times, like we're, if we're using, or using is a terrible word, but we're using people in an experience to creatively advance the experience. So um, to me, it's, it's like this issue of true co-design. So co-design is this term that's become popular, but true co-design is if I'm building for this group of people, they're in from the start. Therefore, they're paid from the start, they're credited from the start, whether they are, have my, my, I can leverage my experience as a writer or a director, but they are, their lived experience in building that experience is valuable and therefore paid. And so a lot of times we, we see um, kind of a, you know, a hangover almost from uh, research, right? That we can just glean stories. But the moment a person tells us a story, then we, we have to acknowledge that. We have to pay, honestly. And we have to, in the co-design, uh, invite participation there. So in other words, even in this, we are, as an ambivert who spent most of the morning back on the couch there, um, even this is privileging extroverts. So we're, we're building with extroverts. We're making experiences with, with extroverts, you know, we're, um, and, and, and what we're trying to do with our kids stuff anyway is like build opt-in, opt-out. So that if you're inside an experience and you, you, you can leave it, you can relax, you can, you know, different, we have different stations, but 
I think it's really key that that is one thing that technology can do, bring together a lot of voices, but we have to value those voices. We have to say this is shared author authorship, this is shared creation. Yeah, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Yes, Go for I, it. I think about interaction on um, several levels. And um, first is um, when it comes to VR and connected uh, VR with uh, theater. Um, first, the environment that we are creating virtually um, should be solid, and then the interaction happens. Um, then another thing that is important is communication, when you can really talk to a um, character, an animated character, or another um, person who is uh, participating in it. Then another thing is when you can move the objects and uh, interfere with uh, the environment. Mm, and, um, and when you make mm, magic with style or with, uh, with some uh, visual effects, so let's say. Um, but also I would like to mm, and just mention about uh, Grotowski's uh, theory, uh, art as vehicle. And uh, I think there are many types of theater and, um, and it could be all interactive, but um, in this theory, um, theater was supposed to be uh, used like the whole space. Uh, there is no division. Uh, nobody is dividing the audience and the actors. Everyone is participating and all the space is used. So mm, for me, this is the, the true interaction. Hmm. I kind of want to propose a provocation here, which is that, um, is, it, is it that we're actually shifting uh, eras in terms of mm, going from, from, from art that is like uh, author driven to, to more of a collaboration driven approach to art, or perhaps the, the new author is a, a collaborator? Could I, yeah, so, um, well, for in terms of that collaborative, as you, as you, as you bring up Gartowski brings in, the, a lot of these ideas of collaborative art really come from I mean, even before this, but certainly Fluxus and performance art in the 1960s um, and the idea of participatory theater. And it goes even before that as well. So the technology is um, providing new ways potentially to create the kind of participation or to create the, in most cases, I think the illusion of participation without any real participation. Mm -hmm. uh, but oh, I wait, want can you elaborate on that? Well, <laughs> so I'm thinking in particular of uh, game structures, both in gaming and in this game structure, where there is, in fact, a very, very limited um, path that you can take. Um, so in some, if you've got a branching narrative, then you've basically just written X number, even if it's 100, you've written a certain number of, of pieces and people can pick which one they're gonna do. There's nothing even remotely interactive or participatory about that any more than anything else, but it creates the illusion, I'm making my choice here, this is really great. I picked the ending, no you didn't. Right, you, you just read one of, you, you passively consumed one of the endings that had been prepared for you. Uh, and uh, that politically could be very, very problematic in giving people this feeling of empowerment when they absolutely have none. Yeah, I mean, we just, a lot of us, I think, probably experienced Bandersnatch a couple of months ago, which is totally that framework. I, I'm so sorry to do this to you, Gata, but can, can you come sit here and just talk about what we've been working on, because it's, it's too related. Uh, sure, uh, well, uh, we're working in VR and that, I think that is often seen as like fundamentally interactive in this way. And um, I really like to distinguish between um, the fact that the form allows for interactivity and has these sort of input systems and the, the narrative or structural level of a piece. I think that um, like what you're talking about. I, I would say that is interactive because you are inputting information that affects it. Um, and 
like even I, th I think we're talking about different levels of interactivity. Like the th the idea that theater is fundamentally interactive, on some level, is saying if I'm responding to you, if you're changing a moment of what happens on stage, that's interactive on some level, and that makes sense. But that's not on any level going into the structure of the experience or the narrative of the experience, which I would say what you're talking about does go into the structure you're having, but it's a confined, it's a confined. Um, a confined version of it, but I think um, like one of the things working in VR, people always want to talk about um, interactivity because it fundamentally has this um, element of moving in the space, and I think it's a really separate question than what the technologies are because you can use the technologies to structure really, really confined narrative experiences, and what you're doing is almost like in VR, like one of the things I actually love this process of thinking about how do you mitigate the interactivity so that you can structure experience because to me that's a key part of narrative and that's one of the things I think about all the time. And if you're trying to think, like how do you, like the question that you raised about um, how do you get people to bring more of themselves and almost the ways that they want to think into a piece? I feel like that's fundamentally a different question than what technologies you use. It's like you can run that process through different technologies. And then when you apply or work th mentally through those technologies, you're actually trying to get people to engage or think differently. Um, Thank you. Sorry to just do that to you. Uh, does anyone have something want to jump on that? Yeah, I think this ties to the tyranny of rationale, you know, and that there's many different ways to think, and we've privileged rationale, and we've privileged certain story structures, and so you know, some uh, you know, uh, very interested in fractured thinking, you know, and how. Um, what is um, thought of as disordered thinking is actually arriving at solutions a lot faster than rationale. So I think if we think about this when we move through um, technology, super interesting if we allow as much different thinking as possible. And that's recognizing when we want to jump in and structure. Uh, we talk about building the buffet, like keeping it open as long as possible before deciding what to eat. And she wants to eat right away. <laughs> but yeah. Okay, check, check, check. Pink mic, pink mic, check, check. Okay. Hi, Vijay, I'm on the pink mic, yeah. Uh, all right, so now we expand it full circle. I think I see something here. Yeah, um, just because the microphone was over here. Uh, yeah, I think it's very interesting to think about sort of levels of interaction in terms of the historical continuum of theater as it's evolving, and I think something that's maybe missing from a conversation is a discussion of spectacle, you know, um, which has always been innate to theater. So how are these new forms of interactivity, these new forms of participation, actually helping us enhance the, the wonder of the theater and the actual, the, the element of surprise, the element of spectacle, um, which is part of what makes theater a vibrant art form. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Um, I, I just wanted to also go back for a little bit. I think uh, Brenda was mentioning the idea of immersion, and I wanted to maybe uh, actually more of a question, <laughs> like hear a little more about it and um, thinking that, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but um, I think across all really art forms, the idea of uh, suspension of reality is such is something we strive for, we want as uh, participant audience, uh, artists. Uh, this engagement that takes us, you know, there were also many interesting points about a uh, different body, a different place. Um, and I do wonder if, uh, you know, and I have worked with various ways of in including in, um, interactivity in my work. Sometimes using technology actually, we want to in incorporate because we want to uh, expand on that suspension of reality. We want uh, to draw the audience, our participants more into the work and make it more immersive. But I think it sometimes happens that actually we end up on the other side of it because we, um, 
we kind of activate activate a person's body or mind in a moment where they uh, find another place might actually kind of have the opposite effect of it. And I don't know, maybe this is kind of actually a question, if you can talk a little bit more about that idea of immersion versus interactivity. I guess I'm next. Oh, or someone yeah. else. So I think it's, it goes back to the um, that question of agency again. I mean, in, in um, with immersion, you can be you're more viscerally involved. You know, it's like you know theater companies that take you from room to room or ask you to, um, you know, to participate. Uh, you eat a meal with them, or you know, there's I mean, there's just all kinds of different forms of really immersive theater. I mean, more so. I mean. In, in the sense that all theater is immersive, because I, I do believe that um, emotionally. Um, but there's that physical immersion. Um, interactivity to me is a different game. That's where you make, you actually make choices that affect outcomes. So there are consequences to uh, what it is that you do that, um, that changes the outcome. And sometimes it's a binary choice, you know, and it's not, you know, a little bit of branching narrative. Um, sometimes it's more devastating, you know, but it's all depending on consequences to the actions that you take. That's, to me, more interact, that's interactive. So, does that help? I'd love to tag on to that because I wanted to speak about agency as well. And so, um, the residency that I run is a 360 video creation residency. It's called Immersion, and it started as a immersive theater and VR creation residency, and then the technology was so novel that every artist that came just wanted to make VR pieces. So um, it's focused on that. And in the first year, just speaking about this um, question of agency and um, affecting outcomes, so in working with VR and workshopping with artists how to create stories in VR, we, I've developed this idea of prismatic storytelling so that it's actually really harnessing the agency of the viewer um, and a lot like so that the entire environment tells the story. Um, and it's not about forcing them to look in a particular place. Um, sorry, I'm shaking, <laughs> I'm nervous. Uh, my colleague Naima Ramos Chapman in the first year of the residency made a piece about um, we were we, the residency takes place in the South and there's horrific um, history around racial violence in the South, of course, in particular in this town, Wilmington. And she ended up making a piece that placed the viewer in the middle of um, an environment where on one side, I really am nervous, I don't know why, on one side there's two white women on a picnic blanket having a conversation about politics in America. It was in 2016. Um, and on the other side there's a, a lynching happening. And the artist, or the person, the audience, um, has a choice to look in one direction or the other. And their choice is a reflection of their relationship with racial dynamics in, or actually their choice is a reflection of so many different things. And it's influencing the outcome of the piece, but it's also influencing how we're gonna have a conversation afterwards about the piece. Um, so anyway, just to sort of complicate that idea of agency and as it's related to how we, uh, you know, are situated within the social realities that we're inside of, and then how we enter a kind of digital space. That's what I wanted to put into the room. Um, this is sort of dialing back to a slightly earlier uh, train of thought. Um, one of the things, worked on a big project last year that was very much uh, people wandering around town getting sort of clues and directives off their phones as part of the project, very GPS kind of thing based. And one of the things we found was really important was allowing people to have a chance to not interact. So the tempo is really important to allow people to stop <laughs> and not actually be constantly buried with like, you know, your text messages pop. It's like when you go viral on Twitter or something and your notifications go off the wall. We didn't want to have that happen in our experience. That, so you could always stop it. You were always sort of in control of when things were going to come at you, which was, we found was a really important part of not overwhelming the audience. Uh, so the ability to not interact was a key part. So it's sort of small scale interaction, not bigger scale narrative interaction, but tempo and pacing is one of those things that gets very complicated to do when you're dealing with an interactive medium versus a scripted, produced, one-off medium. So, thanks. I'm not next. <laughs> There's different, uh, different ways of, of 
con conceptualizing things. And, and, and in, our, in our case, uh, in some of the work that we've been doing, it's, it's we've been looking at um, immersion uh, and its relationship to, to, to presence, uh, and ultimately looking at, at, um, at how to impact uh, emotionally and, and how to uh, um, have some sort of emp empathetic reaction from the audience. So the, uh, the way that we've been looking at it is that, that as with uh, a book or a, a really well done film, uh, there's an immersion that takes place, but, but with, with virtual reality, a lot of what uh, people have been looking at in the literature anyways is looking at, at, at virtual reality uh, and the different ways that, that you can immerse uh, technically. So, so the elements of immersion in a lot of the work on, on virtual reality is, is it spatialized sound? Is it, is it, is it, is it, is it stereoscopic? Uh, or is it, uh, is it, is it 2D? Uh, what's the fidelity of the image? And in that context, the, the interaction that you have is, is seen, oftentimes seen as another element of the, of the technical. So comparing, you know, do you, uh, can you look, do you, do you just look around or, or do you actually have the ability to, to, to move around uh, and to be able to see the space behind, uh, which gives you more interactivity within the scene. Simply looking around like this is, is, is like looking at a, an IMAX screen in a sense, but it gives you more, more, uh, more ability to do so, but then looking. At, someone earlier talked about uh, in the in the smaller group uh, the I idea of, of presence, really. So presence being either spatial or or beyond that being a, 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 a social presence. So the the uh, the spatial presence being that idea of walking around or or interacting with the objects in the environment, but then having virtual characters, whether it's avatars or 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 uh, Virtual characters that have been pre-recorded, providing that that social presence. So that's the way we've we've been looking at it is that sort of layer from immersion interaction as an element of immersion and then presence and the impact that that has on on an audience. Rob, uh, I'm sorry, I forget your name, but I I have a question for you because uh, I was really interested in the idea of agency. Um, and you said, what does it mean to give the audience agency, and do they want it? Uh, and I worked a lot with audiences, and I did a show that Michael c commissioned, curated me to do, I guess, so he saw it, uh, in where I had three community members, and we taught them all how to use Twitter, and then Beth, who was on the screen earlier, did all this amazing video design, and these three women in their 70s, like, talked about legacy in the context of leaving things on the internet versus leaving things in real life and what that means for them. and. We asked the audience to tweet back to pre-written tweets that had come as sort of a pop-up video for the show. So the women had written sort of a subscript to be tweeted out live during the show, and we asked people to tweet back. And we had quite a number of people in the audience tweeting. But what we found in the end was that what they ended up tweeting largely when we put it all up on the screen for the women to react to was actually recording what was happening or reporting on what was happening rather than engaging in the questions that were being asked. And so the culture of engagement being actually about I was here, which I see some of us have done already. You could, like I did the same thing this morning. Like I'm here in this beautiful space to report or record rather than to engage or react or question. And I guess I just wondered about the difference. When you're talking about agency, what does that mean? We should just... Good, good teamwork with the mic. Okay. Um, yeah, I get back to agency. It's like having an actual effect on something. So what you're talking about, that's why I say, I'm not sure audiences all want it because um, I've created several experiences for the Games for Change Festival, which is in New York City next weekend. And it's a different tack. It's from a, 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 a game perspective. But we did a piece a few years ago on um, gun violence. And it turned into a theater piece. And it was about point, counterpoint, counter objectives. And two actresses improvised. I mean, they had a, a loose script uh, story they were following, but they were improvising. One, their friends, one found a handgun in her friend's, accidentally found a handgun in her friend's purse. And they had this intense conversation about, you know, the, the objective was the one to get her friend to give up the gun willingly, and the other was to justify why she wanted to keep the gun. Um, but we also let the audience drive the conversation. So 
we gave, created an app where they were able to send questions um, and observations and comments on the action. And, um, and then we'd aggregate you know, the ones that were similar and bring them to the top. And then the actresses had phones in front of them and they had to read. So it was very complicated and involved, uh, very interesting. But you know, you'd occasionally get like, where did she buy her dress? Um, you know, why doesn't she cut her hair? You know, and so you'd get these catty griefers um, who just wanted to see they wanted to see whether or not they had agency. Um, you know, it's like, are they really paying attention? Are we really having an effect? And so there's that kind of awkward learning curve you go through when you throw something in front of an audience where they're like, I don't believe it. I'm going to test this and find out if I really have. And then, but by then, you lose something. So, you know, you get those, those oddball comments in, um, and it takes away from the power of what you're trying to create as a theater piece. So, it's complicated, and I don't have any answers. I just have a lot of observations about, God, that didn't work, you know, because, because we couldn't control that. You know, but if you control it too much and the audience doesn't feel like they have any kind of effect, then they feel cheated. So, it's finding that sweet spot which, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer, so. Speaking Does of loss help? of control. What's uh, that? Speaking of loss of control, I, I'm actually gonna wrap things up because we're already at the end of this uh, conversation, but I just wanted to share something related to what will happen after, which is we have this concert, choir, 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 it's going on right here this evening, and uh, we're doing two things with it. One is we're sending a live stream to these three venues in, in Montreal, Vancouver, and Toronto, and, and so, they'll be experiencing this community concert with us. But there's also this element of we want interactivity. We don't want to just broadcast a concert to, to these venues. We want to be able to hear the venues. We want the venues to be able to feel and see us. And, and so that is a grand experiment that you will all be able to see tonight in the context of this conversation. We really don't, we really don't understand how it's going to work. I'm going to go in that room and look at it shortly. But, but, but just to point out that any time that there is this level of interactivity, there's a lot of risk involved, and you don't really know what's going to come back at you. And so when, when we see this concert tonight, it would be very interesting to see like uh, this experiment in interactivity. How does it empower these creators? Are these people on the other side? Like These questions of agency, are they the singers? Are they part of this? Are they in the room with us? Do they impact us from across distance? And so I'm really happy to have this example of interactivity for us to talk about at the end of this. Two other things. Uh, the next session is only one hour long. So just encourage you to just really take a, a, a straight up 15 minute break, because uh, that's, that's how we're gonna roll into this last section. And uh, I, I just have to do this, but just to say, I'm sure that the theater has always been interactive, but we wouldn't be curating the festival the way we did if we weren't sure that digital tools have changed how the work has to be made. Uh, and so that, I think, is an important distinction. Perhaps interactivity has always been there, but these tools require different creative processes and different supports, and, and I'm willing to argue with each of you individually over the course of the next four days. <laughs> okay, we're on break. Thanks.